Hello, everyone. Welcome to OCIC's International Development Week 2024 inaugural panel, Navigating Gender and Water Challenges Globally. My name is Pragya Tikku, and I'm the Community Engagement and Gender Equality Specialist at OCIC. I wanted to start off with a few housekeeping notes. OCIC is committed to creating a safe and inclusive space. We ask all of you to commit to our code of conduct inspired by those of the Intercouncil Network and Amnesty Canada. This code outlines our shared commitments towards respect, inclusion, humility, safety, solidarity, patience, and openness for all participants and collaborators. Today's session will be conducted in English with simultaneous French interpretation. To listen to the interpretation on a computer, locate the globe icon along the bottom row of your Zoom screen and select your language channel. If you are joining via the Zoom app on a mobile device, click more or the three dots in the bottom right corner of your screen, select language interpretation, then choose your language. Please note that closed captioning is available and can be accessed by clicking on the show captions options in Zoom. You will be able to move the transcript box around, the, around your screen as well. Throughout the event, feel free to ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We also invite you to join the conversation on social media using hashtag IDW2024 and to tag OCIC on your preferred platform. I would now like to begin by sharing that OCIC recognizes and honors the indigenous peoples who have historically and do presently live and work on the traditional, both treaty and unceded territories that we operate on. These include the Huron Bendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit River First Nation, and many others. We acknowledge that our board, staff, volunteers, members, and broader community operate on the treaty and unceded territories of these and numerous other indigenous peoples and nations. As we reflect on our role, Within a settler colonial context, we acknowledge the importance of naming the indigenous peoples and nations on whose lands we live, work and play, and understand the importance of framing our engagement in the international cooperation sector and beyond through the lens of reconciliation and decolonization. We recognize that we have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with indigenous peoples who have and continue to fight for social justice on their own lands. I'm now honored to welcome and introduce Mr. Dominic O'Neill. Dominic O'Neill is the executive director of the UN Sanitation and Hygiene Fund since its inception. Dominic worked for the UK government as a senior civil servant in the Department for International Development as the country director in Yemen, Sierra Leone and Nepal, and as a head of the UN department. He then served at, as the UK's executive director for the African Development Bank from 2013 to 2016. He was the global COO of World Wildlife Fund International from 2017 to 2020. It is my absolute pleasure to hand it over to Mr. O'Neill for his opening remarks. Thank you, Pragya. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, it's a real honor um, to have uh, been invited by the Ontario Council for International Cooperation to make some opening remarks. I didn't hesitate in accepting the offer because uh, when I saw the title, Navigating Gender and Water Challenges, that's how uh, me and my team spend every minute of the working day and many minutes of the non-working day thinking about how we can do better. Um, you may wonder what the Sanitation Hygiene Fund is. Uh, you can see the logo behind there. We um, are, are part of the United Nations. And we, we came about because of a recognition that the issues of sanitation, hygiene and menstrual health, which many of you will recognize as SDG 6.2, were woefully underfunded. That the, the amounts of traditional odor, the official development assistance is going down. But worse than that, the donor, the donor organizations under the existing model we're losing confidence in the ability to demonstrate impact. So we came about as a, um, an effort to turn that around, but actually we haven't taken, the, uh, taken that challenge straight on. We've actually said the current model isn't working anymore of traditional 
development assistance, that it isn't mobilizing the necessary amounts of funding, nor was it putting um, necessarily putting gender and climate and sustainable innovative finance at the forefront of the discussion. So that is why we exist and perhaps why I was invited to make the opening remarks. So what I'm going to talk about is how we're trying to do that and a little bit more on the, uh, the current approach to development finance and how we can and must include gender as a main element of that, certainly in, in our sector of sanitation, hygiene and menstrual health. I'll also talk about why sanitation, hygiene and menstrual health, we believe, are the frontier, the next frontier for impact investment and for meaningful, sustainable investment by a wide range of actors and how we put gender at the core of that issue. Uh, and then finally, why um, it makes sense that th this gender smart investment in sanitation hygiene is an investment in the collective, in our, all of our collective futures. So I'm not sure how many of the participants, uh, I know certainly the panelists are uh, in the similar world where we, um, re we rely on initially the traditional development assistance coming in from uh, many of the, the generous donors. But that era, quite frankly, is coming to an end. It won't happen quickly, but it's changed over the last decade. If you look at the, um, the change in terms of the types of foundations and donors that we're engaging with, it's fundamentally changed and will change again over the coming decade. Now, that means that we need to adapt. If we want to continue to achieve our development objectives, we need to adapt in our development model. Um, and while you know, people may be concerned and say we need to increase the amount of um, bilateral development assistance, we also need to make sure that we are making the best for every single dollar. That's one point. The second point is that actually the, the way we delivered and even the, even saying the way we delivered development um, must change. Many of our bilateral partners, our country partners, uh, have much more capability and capacity. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the time for the top-down development led by the Global North has ended. That, that time is over. We now look and, and are fortunate to deal with country partners who have capacity, who have financial acumen, who have the same commitment to development that we would look for in any of our partners. And that, so we need to find new ways of engaging those country level partners, for example, whether it's the Nigerian Development Bank or partners in Kenya and Uganda that we're working with, uh, and new donors. We're currently um, reaching out to a whole range of private foundations and philanthropists in Asia who have a very different expectation of how um, they want to engage in and support development. What is a thread running through that are climate smart investments and gender smart investments. There is a broad recognition that whatever area of whatever sector of development you're in, that it needs to be gender sensitive and climate sensitive. This for us is in our DNA. We know in my own career, I've worked in sanitation for, for many years. Um, and uh, we know that the, there is a disproportionate impact on women and girls on the gender-based violence from uh, women and girls having to go outside of, uh, of the home uh, to go to the bathroom at night, um, and that uh, whether, or whether on the wash side, the water side, carrying water, there's a disproportionate impact. That's been well understood. Um, but we're ensuring that, that achieving that impact, the positive impact, is put into the core of our um, approach. So the new development, um, era, a new era of development finance is here. We're having to react to it. Um, and perhaps during the course of, of your discussions throughout the, throughout the week, it's worth reflecting on how we all need to respond to that, what the risks are, what the fears are. But most importantly, what are the opportunities to mobilize new finance, to find new partners who um, match our ambition in terms of climate smart, gender sensitive um, approaches? In terms of the second point of gender um, impact investment and the opportunity within sanitation, hygiene and menstrual health. 
Today, one in four girl, women and girls globally struggle to manage their menstruation safely and with dignity. In the SHF, we take the approach that a market-based um, solution to menstrual health will deliver sustainable solutions to million, millions of menstruators around the world who cannot fulfill their potential until they have this um, opportunity, the facility and the commodities at their disposal. There cannot be gender equality without access to safe quality and affordable menstrual solutions and safely managed sanitation. And we believe that shaping thriving menstru what we call menstrual hygiene markets can deliver that structural change. Now you may wonder, but why, why don't these markets exist? They, the demand exists, but the supply chains have failed, certainly in the countries we're operating uh, and work and partnering with. The supply chains do not uh, go stretch out into these countries and these regions. So now many people in the call may be uncomfortable with a private sector or market-based approach um, uh, to development. We and, and there are ways um, of it ensuring that the, the solutions, the investments do reach those uh, who are most vulnerable and least likely to be able to afford the markets. The uh, recent survey by uh, Bill and Melinda Gates estimated that across lower middle income countries, 800 million women and girls are ready and willing and able to pay for reusable menstrual hygiene products. Now, because of course there is a, um, there's a solid waste sustainability angle, um, but the evidence suggests that there is a willingness to pay. And even then would prioritize these over other essential goods that need to be, uh, but all of this needs to be sustainably financed. Many, um, as we've looked at this sector, there is a um, uh, sometimes a, the option to go and provide free menstrual products, and that may well be a, an appropriate policy response, but it cannot be the only one. We need to build those sustainable menstrual hygiene marketplaces. And in our experience, as we've looked at this across Africa um, and India, um, they, there are many women-led enterprises that are actually filling this gap. And what they're looking for, they're not looking for development, bilateral development assistance, they're looking for investment. They want angel investors, they want impact investors to come and help them take their product, their idea to scale and to fulfill their supply chain. And that's what we're hoping to do. Um, we're, we're working on this. This isn't just an aspiration. We are delivering this. And we held a, a session in Davos a couple of weeks ago. And again, Davos may not be the place where you'd associate a development actor to be, uh, but we want to put this issue into the core of the, um, the international financing discussions. Sometimes people get embarrassed when we talk about menstrual hygiene in, in any place, um, but you know, we're trying to normalize it and to make it just a, a, a serious development gender equity issue that needs to be properly financed. The same situation occurs in sanitation. Um, I won't bore you all with the, uh, the approach we take on the sanitation economy, but sanitation economies exist everywhere. So as we started to look around at how can we bring more development-based investment in with a gender lens, uh, I want to share a story of, with you about uh, a woman we met in Benin called Eileen. Now, she also saw the same challenge in terms of um, sanitation, that there was insufficient supply of quality goods that would allow people to have safely managed sanitation. So she started um, helping her husband, managing her husband's business, um, building the uh, latrine basis. And now, today, uh, through business support, she's got four um, masons, four sales agents, and people and franchises are um, appearing, and these are building and installing safely managed sanitation. Now, that model times a thousand or times 2000 is what we need in Africa, but there are real tangible opportunities for gender smart, uh, climate smart with the circular sanitation economy opportunities to engage. And we know that you know, SMEs create seven out of 10 jobs in the formal economy and much more in the informal economy. So the, um, the final point on why invest in women, why investing in women is an investment in all of our futures. 
Uh, while we were at Davos, the World Economic Forum released a report, I'm sure many have read it, that addressing the women's health gap could potentially boost the global economy by at least one trillion, one trillion annually by 2040. Now, I have to say, we all knew this in our DNA and our, in our belief, but it's good to have that stated. So bringing that gender lens into the funding for sanitation, hygiene, men menstrual health is not, it's not something we're doing because we feel good about it. It makes sense from an economic perspective, from a social justice and the gender equity perspective. So what, what we are doing as an organization, we're, we're developing the tools, but also we're trying to set the example as to what gender smart investments in a critical sector that are disproportionately affects women and girls can look like to create that real and lasting change. So we get better gender outcomes, we get more sustainably financed interventions in sanitation and menstrual health. Um, and we all know, and everybody on the call, I'm sure, will agree that uh, only by doing this can we even hope to, or aspire to achieving a gender equal world where no woman or girl is held back because of her period or held back because she does not have access to a safely managed sanitation bathroom facility or is unable to wash her hands um, and avoid uh, ill health, shame or gender based violence. So that's why we believe investing in um, sanitation, hygiene, menstrual health is a direct investment in women and girls, in societies and in the, econo in the economies that they need to thrive and to develop um, to deliver this uh, sustainable investment. It's an investment in, in human capital and it's about time that everybody enjoys the benefits of that investment. So with, with that, I hope and wish you all well as you deliberate on the challenge um, of bringing gender and climate into the water um, uh, uh, water challenge for the future. And please reach out to us if you have ideas. If you agree, great. If you disagree, even better, let's hear. And uh, please engage with us. And um, yeah, good luck in the deliberations. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Dominic, and for outlining the dire need to focus on water with regards to gender and your insights into the UN Sanitation and Hygiene Fund's work in this regard. This, along with the examples you shared, is a very useful context to now have as we transition into our panel, where we will hear from experienced international cooperation actors on their projects and impacts in the local and global communities. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the event, Nina Bianchi. Nina Bianchi works as a project manager at the International Secretariat for Water, where she specializes in youth empowerment and sustainable water initiatives. She holds a MA in international development and has previously worked in project management, fundraising, and communication in several international NGOs. The International Secretariat for Water is an NGO based in Montreal, Canada, which brings together citizens and organizations committed to guaranteeing the right to water and therefore universal access to water and sanitation. Their core mission is to empower youth and other vulnerable groups, ensuring their voices resonate in the water sector from local communities to the global stage. With that, I pass it over to you, Nina. Thank you so much, Pragya. And uh, it's an honor to be here today moderating this panel. Um, so as we know, as we've heard from Dominic as well, gender is really a pivotal factor in the water crisis. Vulnerable groups, which of course includes women and girls, are bearing the brunt of all water risks. Um, and at the same time, these groups are not represented and heard nearly enough in water governance mechanisms, um, be it at the local level, at the global level. And this makes it really crucial and urgent to empower the voices of civil society and in general of uh, communities that are most vulnerable to water scarcity, to the lack of access to clean water, uh, and to the impact of climate change in general. That is what we focus uh, on at the International Secretariat for Water. We're working to in ensure active participation um, of civil society and of youth at all governance levels. And this um, has two aspects to it. On one hand, it includes fighting to make space at the table for them through information, through advocacy. And on the other hand, it also includes equipping them 
with the necessary tools, the necessary resources, um, enabling them to contribute meaningfully to the solutions that are being brought and make sure that these solutions are sustainable and uh, just. And on the international level, at the moment, we feel that there is a real momentum um, around water. The impact of the climate crisis um, and the, the water crisis are being felt by countries more and more uh, every year, every day. And we see that water is becoming more present in global conversations. Um, for example, in, in March 2023, there was a United Nations conference on water, which was held in New York. And this was actually the first um, global conference, well, the first UN conference on water since 1977 which is crazy to think about. Um, and we also see water being more, more present, in, present in climate conversations like the COP. Um, it's also one of, one of the SDGs. The sixth uh, SDG is, is dedicated to water. And we see action is being taken in the right direction. Uh, Dominique also spoke to how uh, change is to change in how uh, international development is being funded and managed. But we need to make sure that these changes and this momentum uh, include women, include youth, include indigenous people, and include all vulnerable groups. Um, for us, at the International Secretary for Water, a lot of our work focuses on youth. And uh, one of the examples of our project is the Fill Up the Glass campaign, uh, which we uh, launched as the Global Youth Movement for Water. Um, for the UN conference um, in 2023 that I just mentioned. And this was an effort to advocate collectively and make sure that young voices are heard uh, in this global event as um, a more collective voice. And the reason we focus on youth is that, well, on one hand, young people share the same reality as women and as other vulnerable group, which is that, uh, as Dominique said as well, they are disproportionately affected by water risk and yet they're not adequately represented in governance mechanisms. Um, and on the other hand, youth is also part of the solution um, as they play a crucial role is in also mitigating the gender impacts uh, of the water crisis. They can challenge the status quo. They have the power to bring rapid and sustainable change. Um, and this is why we decide to work with youth and with other vulnerable groups. And um, we will hear today from our panelists, I'm sure, um, on why this change is really urgently needed in the context of gender and water. And uh, we'll also engage in collective discussion on some actionable strategies uh, to accelerate this change. So I'm very excited to, to hear from our panelists and uh, I have the pleasure to introduce them right now. Um, so I will start with Professor Grace Oluwasanya and she is the project lead for water climate and gender research at the United Nations University the Institute for Water, Environment and Health. She's a professor of water safety and health with over 20 years of progressive experience in research, teaching and research supervision in a higher education institution in one of the largest countries of the global south. She's also a WHO accredited global water safety plan trainer at international and country level. She holds a PhD in water resource management uh, from Cranfield University in the UK and a master's in international land and water management from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you for being here today with us, Professor Grace. Um, I'll now introduce uh, Anne Turiano. Uh, she is currently the IFAD representative and country director for Burkina Faso in the Western Central Africa division. And prior to this was country director for Sierra Leone. Her work focuses on rural transformation for rural smallholder farmers, supporting design and implementation of programs that enable access to agricultural inputs and financial services, support infrastructure development, enhance food and nutrition security, support gender mainstreaming and inclusion of youth, and strengthen resilience to climate change. She has over 15 years of experience as a practitioner in sustainable rural development and rural transformation. Thank you, Anne, for being here with us today. Um, our third panelist is Adnan Kader. Uh, he is a researcher, activist, and governance specialist who leads the climate policy support work for WaterAid Bangladesh and provides regional oversight for South Asia. His work focuses on building bridges between water and climate change policies, focusing on adaptation and lasting damage. Adnan finished his master's uh, from University of Waterloo and was an activist with Climate Reality Ontario before moving back to Bangladesh. Uh, thanks so much, Adnan, for being here with us today. 
Um, so to get us started, I will invite our three panelists to briefly introduce yourself and especially introduce your work, um, including the connections that you witness in your work between uh, gender and water. Uh, can we start with you, Professor Grace? Thank you, Nina. And thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, my, I'm Grace Olua Sawyer. Professor of Water Resources Management, as we've had, and I currently lead the research um, for water climate and gender at United Nations University Institute for Water Environment and Health, based in Canada. Here at uh, UNU INWE, that's the acronym for my organization. Uh, strategic focus on the water climate gender space is actually to promote inclusive water management. And this we do by utilizing gender statistics. So there is a couple of um, ongoing projects in this regard. We believe in terms of gender statistics, the, the place to start is numbers. You know, so far we've not had you know, a global assessment of women's representation in the water sector. There had been quite a, you know, a few of assessments in this regard, but they've been isolated. A couple of years ago, World Bank tried it, 64 utilities. If we throw that number into the globe, it's not so much representative. So it's quite ambitious, but we have embarked on this. And then we believe that the data set, you know, will provide the quantitative insight into the degree to which, you know, women are represented across, you know, the water sector. Um, one of the ways we believe this will flip the, the rhetoric is, if at the country level, you, your status is probably 19% of women, for instance, you know, is your current status. We believe with these statistics, you can see that you have a huge opportunity to increase, you know, that percentage and you can now strategically plan, you know, okay, in the next uh, couple of years, in the next two years or five years, I want to increase this proportion, you know, by say 25% or 30% as, as you go along. So we believe gender statistics can really force, you know, increasing uh, women's representation in the, in the water sector as part of any other innovative ideas that will come. Another aspect, you know, of our work is differential impact assessment, you know, um, and by that we mean uh, the analysis of um, or examination due to gender differences or and by age group. And this we believe will also uh, promote um, uh, what's it called inclusive water management across board. This I'll be able to talk a bit more as the discussion goes along. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Grace. I think um, your insights um, from a, a data and a research perspective will be um, absolutely crucial today. This is something that we lack in general in the water sector. We're not that good at data and research. Um, so it's, it's great that you're here with us today. Um, Anne, I'll pass it on to you uh, to introduce yourself and, and your work. Okay. Thank you very much, Nina. And I hope you can hear me. My name is Anne Turinayo, and I am the country director for Burkina Faso for an institution that is called the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you so much to the organizers of this event, because I believe that when we start to talk about issues, uh, they get hard and uh, maybe then something is done about them. So thank you very much. Uh, what do I do? What do we do? myself personally, and then as part of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And I'm going to be specific to the context of Burkina Faso in this case. What we are trying to do is to uh, program in a way, and I, I would like to say, by the way, thank you so much to the keynote speaker and to Professor Grace, because all the issues they've raised they are very pertinent, like be it the development financing as we see it right now, and the fact that we need to find new ways to finance development. 
talk about the statistics. Uh, actually, if you like try to do a search right now, uh, be it on the water access or on sanitation, for instance, what's the ratio of toilets or pit latrines to the number of women or men in a country, you'll not find those numbers anywhere. Yet we have resources, we have universities, we have learning institutions, we have people that could do all this research. So unless we really know what are the numbers and we can actually in integrate that in our programming, I think we are we still have a ways to go. So yes, I'm from the operational side, clearly. And uh, we're always, uh, what we are trying to push for now is to kind of go on the ground listen to the people, listen to these women that we say we want to represent in the agricultural space, for instance. So um, we, we live in a context where you have policies, they're the right policies, but are they being implemented? And how then can our work influence the policies that exist, or at least the implementation of parts of those policies that work? So that's the crucial point in what we do. And then again, to the reality, on the, again, on the numbers. And again, thank you so much, Professor Grace. If you have currently the situation in the country where I work, we are dealing with a nexus that has gone beyond just, you know, uh, development, uh, humanitarian, uh, and then now we are putting in climate change, right? which is super high, but now we are no longer just doing about, um, you know, fragility the normal way. We are looking at real conflict and how this affects women and girls. I'm talking about the fact that uh, as of end of 2022, I guess, uh, we, we are talking about 1.9 million refugees, inter rather internally displaced people, about 35,000 uh, uh, refugees coming from the neighboring countries. We are talking about the fact that health facilities, uh, about 600 of them have been affected and over 200 have been closed. And then you're talking about the fact that you have over 6,250 schools that have been closed, I think since the end of 2021, when the conflict has really increased. Now you ask yourself, where are these girls going? You know, what is happening to them? Right. And then you probably, if you're curious and if you're curious about the Sahel, you've seen the stories where women have been attacked on their way to go and collect water and firewood. Why? Because it's even very unsafe to go out there and collect the basic water and fuel. So, yes, more on this later. <laughs> but this is uh, this is why I want to say really very interesting uh, topic and conversation. Thanks again, Nina. Over to you. Thank you, Anne. I think it's it's going to be a uh, very enriching to hear about the specific context that that you are um, operating in, and I'm looking forward to to hear more on that. Um, I'll pass it over to you, Adnan, um, to introduce yourself and your work. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Parga. Thank you, Dominic, and the other two speakers. Uh, my name is Adnan Kader. I work with Water in Bangladesh as a government specialist. Before I start speaking, I'd like to recognize um, that every view and every thought shared in my um, remarks are based on the climate vulnerable people of Bangladesh. And I'll start off with a quote. Um, See, I'm blind, but I'm not deaf. When I hear the thundering storms of the cyclones, I'm scared for my life. I hear people screaming, things falling apart. I know something terrible is happening. I can't see it, but I'm leaving it. Um, this is a quote from Reshma, an uh, adolescent girl from the coastal belt of Bangladesh. Uh, she's blind, uh, she's differently abled, um, and every year uh, du during cyclone season, um, she goes through the reality oftentimes most people around the world don't see. And as we speak, Bangladesh have seen six different cyclones in the last three years. And every time it happens, it's a different reality. Uh, for different people, but for, in general, women and girls in the coastal belt of Bangladesh, the reality is the same every year. And the harrowing truth is that um, every year when this happens, um, this group, uh, this cohort, um, is facing the brunt of climate change differently. And um, moving forward, um, this um, women and girls who are living and the different impacts of climate change um, are 
the stark reality of what's happening in places like Bangladesh. So as part of my work, um, my job is to connect the stories with the policies, um, and especially through a governance lens, especially in the uh, climate and water sector. As because um, through water sanitation hygiene, though ha we have made a remarkable progress in the last couple of years, in the decade, um, seeing the um, impact of climate change on water sanitation particularly, as Dominic was mentioning, um, is um, different and we need to catch up, especially in terms of climate finance. Um, it's just 3% for water sanitation, 5% for water security. And that really doesn't trickle down to places like um, countries in Africa or places like in Bangladesh. Climate finance is missing. And I do agree with Dominic that private sector funding should be um, reachable. But coming back to the stories, how do we um, connect those dots, uh, especially through policy lens is something I work with. And my um, other hat is as an often activist, I do speak up for climate justice and uh, especially um, vulnerable women, adolescent girls, um, especially from different parts of Bangladesh. As I go along, I'll talk about the different stories. Also, um, the positive side of how uh, water in Bangladesh is creating an impact in those particular areas. So what do you Nina? Thank you. Thank you, Adnan, and, and thank you for, for highlighting the, the importance of really make sure that we do reach everyone. And yes, we talk about women and girls as um, as a broad category, but obviously this, in, this we have to include intersectionality in this and also think about all of the other vulnerabilities that can interact with this in terms of context, in terms of, as you said, people who live with disability and, and who live in, in places that are hard to reach, etc. So um, I'm looking forward to, to hearing your, your perspective on that also today. Um, so I'll now have some more specific questions for each of our panelists. Um, and as we go through the discussion, I also invite our participants to ask your questions um, via the, the Q&A uh, function of the webinar. And you can ask your questions as we go, um, and we'll, we'll take some of your questions at the, at the end of, of the panel. Um, so my first question is for Professor Grace. Uh, could you speak to the reasons behind the differential impacts of lack of water on women and girls that uh, you've come across in your research and in your project? Well, thank you, Nina. Before I go into the specific uh, reasons, I would like to set a bit of context, you know, that uh, historically we all acknowledge the fact that if we consume unsafe water, you come down with some um, uh, ailments, diarrhea diseases, cholera, and, and the like. So, and a lot of studies that are out there, you know, this is the focus on the generic impact of um, how poor water quality affects uh, human, human beings. And this is because water serves as a pathway, you know, for conveying pathogens or chemicals to millions of, of people you know, out there because of its own distinct uh, nature. You know, water is a, it has a, is a universal solvent. By this, I mean, it has the capacity to dissolve almost anything that it encounters. So that makes um, water a, a, a pathway in, um, in particular people in that regard. So millions of people have suffered water-related diseases, you know, and, and, and the likes. But what is missing that it's not there it has studies into the holistic gendered impact. We don't know the extent or the proportion to which any of this affects men differently from women or boys differently from, from girls. So that's pretty much the context, you know, and um, this also, you know, has um, uh, cascaded into even at the global level when we monitor access to safe, safe, uh, safely managed uh, wash, uh, wash services, you know, the SDG indicators, we still monitor at the general level, looking at the proportion of people, you know, the percentage of, of the population that have access. You know, we still have, you know, the, the, those, those gendered, you know, impact into the specific of how many women have access to safely managed you know, what resources are just not there. So these are the, you know, the background, you know, for, for us. Now, you asked about the reasons why we have differential impacts. I guess the, the, the first one will be, 
the fact that we have a um, physiological composition, different physiological composition. You know, the physiological composition of a woman is different from that of a man. I mean, that's basic, that's natural, you know. And having said that, it means that there will be specific uses of water, you know. Different uh, women will use water in a specific way. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. Uh, Dominique sets the scene in, in this regard, already talking about menstruation. You won't be a woman if you don't menstruate at the time of life, <laughs> you know, that you need to menstruate. Likewise, you won't be a man if you don't uh, release a body fluid, you know, at the time of life, you need to release the body fluid. You know, I believe these are not um, F words, they're natural, so we should be able to speak, you know, about them quite freely, you know, and there's nothing to be ashamed about, you know, otherwise you won't be, you won't be human. So apart from the fact that all humans are water users, you know, we all use water, whether for drinking, whether for bathing, those are generic, you know, because of our physiological conditions, you know, the, you know, composition, there's still, you know, this specific needs that we have, you know, water that makes us different and that, you know, that dictates differential impact. Another reason why you will expect differential impact is, for instance, socioeconomic uh, condition. You know, if you're well endowed, economically empowered, you know, it will, you know, affect your appetite. You know, you could gravitate towards better quality water, you know, or give you better access to water. This creates differential impact, you know. So the way it will affect someone that's used to in-house connection will be different from someone who has to travel seven kilometers to go and fetch water from a stream. And, you know, so this creates differential impact. Another reason, you know, another causes of differential impact to be disability. If you're differently able, it restricts your access, you know, as well. If you don't have help, you know, it, it, it limits the access that you have, you know, to safely, you know, watch services. And another one that I also believe is critical that we actually need to do something about, especially in the, in, in, 20, in 2024 of the 21st century, are these, you know, social norms, restrictive social norms that over the years put women and children at a disadvantage. And we keep doing this through performative actions. What do I mean? We keep repeating them. Oh, that's the way we've been doing. And we keep, you know, <laughs> we keep doing that, you know, to perpetrate that, you know, I believe this needs to change, especially at this time. So these are some of the things, maybe I should cite an example. I've worked in a community where it's a taboo for a man to go and fetch water from the street, you know? And so the, the, the water collection is strictly for women and girls. So these are some of the taboo, you know, that I refer to as restrictive social norms that needs to, you know, to be constructed, you know, for us to be able to move forward. So to answer your questions, there are actually different reasons that I've highlighted you know, that, you know, facilitate differential impacts of water-related services or water events or climate, you know, event floods, you know, um, droughts and, and, and the likes that dictate differential impacts. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Grace. I think it, it's very interesting uh, uh, in, to, to list all of those ways uh, in which different groups interact with water or are affected by, by access to water and, and, and lack of water in a different way. Um, and also to, to highlight again how we actually need to measure this to be able to, to have a better, a better view um, and to have gendered data on, on uh, water as the realities are so different. Um, and, and yeah, that's it. Definitely something that that needs to be worked on um, in the water sector and in the climate sector in general. Um, my next question is for Adnan. Um, in terms of gendered impact, so um, what has been the gendered impact on water and sanitation, water sanitation and hygiene, so wash, due to climate impact? And having said that, is wash prioritized in mitigating uh, those impacts? Yes. Um. Thank you, Nina. Um. So I'll give you two examples um, from Bangladesh. Um, uh, from the coastal belt, as I mentioned, as I quoted at the beginning, um, you, we are increasingly seeing the impacts of loss and damages. Uh, for example, after a post-climatic um, event um, in uh, waste-deep waters, we are seeing that due to lack of um, adequate sanitation facilities or facilities that uh, are climate resilient, are non-existent in most part of the coastal belt. And after each um, climatic hazard, um, 
fathers, for example, are worried um, because uh, if I uh, give you a reality that uh, women and girls, adolescent girls have to walk through that waste deep water to go to a sanitation facility, which is a bit far from their homes. Um, those are the realities um, uh, families are increasingly facing. And um, due to those impacts, small impacts, um, most of the families are choosing to um, leave those places and go, are opting to move to more urban areas. And uh, that's an example of, and uh, mentioned like climate refugees or climate migrants or internally displaced people. Um, those realities are happening. And one example, uh, example of sanitation, for example, um, is causing that problem in those areas. Um, one um, other example would be, um, uh, as we're talking about menstrual health as well, um, areas that are lacking um, safe drinking water or water for um, accessing um, hygiene facilities. We're seeing um, adolescent girls dropping out of schools because community schools um, in those climate prone areas don't have adequate water services or sanitation services. And usually, usually those girls opt to stay back at home and um, don't fe and opt to not face the taboo surrounding menstrual health on those particular areas. And we're increasingly seeing um, impacts of um, loss and damages, especially in drought prone areas of Bangladesh. Um, for example, uh, women and girls are usually taxed with um, traveling long distance to fetch water. And I'm pretty sure this example is true for any part of the world, um, especially for least developing countries. Uh, we're increasingly seeing it. Uh, what's interesting is that in terms of counting loss and damages, um, if you see the rape cases um, from areas where um, girls have to walk long miles, are um, opting to alternative livelihoods in terms of um, um, losing um, their income in terms of um, um, crops or um, other um, income generating activities um, impacted due to climate change. Um, women and girls are usually buying a lot of medicine, which they don't use to, um, to tackle the pain of uh, walking long distances. So in terms of loss and damages, we're seeing those examples oftentimes coming up a lot. And it's a bit unfortunate that we're not tracking those enough, but uh, from different parts of that particular world, um, we are advocating for those loss and damage uh, finance globally. And as you saw at COP28, loss and damage fund was announced, which is a welcoming um, address from our sector. However, um, connecting uh, those dots more prominently is um, really important. And one last example I would like to share is, um, again, if you want to relate with Canada, um, what happens when sea level rises and salinity intrusion is becoming more prominent? Um, oftentimes it's seen, uh, especially in agriculture um, that areas, um, oftentimes the, um, the man of the household goes to the farming areas. Women are tasked with fetching water, for example, and they are increasingly encroaching in those part of the areas which are waterlogged with um, high level of salinity, and it's affecting the uterus. And I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, it's related to that as well. We're seeing um, girls uh, to avoid uh, problems related to menstruation are um, taking pills um, in Bangladesh uh, to delay their menstruation so that they don't have to deal with um, um, uh, using waters or rags, for example, because those are scarce in those part of the world. Um, so they're taking pills to delay their menstruation. Um, those are the realities of um, impacts of water sanitation hygiene. And I'll just end with um, how we are um, addressing it. Um, water sanitation hygiene, um, as I mentioned, uh, was not that um, prominent or in the spotlight in terms of climate policies. Uh, we are trying to change that reality through um, partners, for example, UNICEF, um, Department of Public Health in Bangladesh. Um, we are inputting those words in the National Adaptation Plan. And also recently for the Global Goal on Adaptation, the indicators have been um, directed to partnership in the water sector. 
and hopefully we will be able to um, address uh, water sanitation hygiene related issues and those examples I mentioned. Slow steps, but we're getting there. Nina, over to you. Thank you, Adnan, uh, for those uh, examples and, and explanations. I think it's it's great to see concretely what uh, Professor Grace was saying being reflected in your uh, specific context and, and on water and sanitation specifically. Uh, so thank you for this. And, and if we now move away a bit from water and sanitation and um, more into agriculture, which is another um, extremely important topic around water. Um, and could you tell us more about the gendered impact of water on women farmers with a focus on how it also impacts their autonomy? Thank you very much, Nina. Once again, the gendered impact of, of water on, on women farmers. So water is one of those resources you need to do agriculture, right? But um, do women have access? Is it equal access? Is it fair? Is it just? That's that's where you can start from. But even before we get to just the water, we know that even for the other sources or uh, resources that you need to produce to to like be an equal partner in the agricultural space, women are not really very much accounted for. And I would like to really clearly say that sometimes it's not for the lack of trying by everybody else that is in that space, right? So you have governments working with partners to develop policies, like I said before, but then the policy implementation becomes something else, right? And then this gets us back again to the question on the development financing. Is it the fact that we've been getting it wrong all along, that we need to change the way development is financed, that we need to, to be market-based? And I know that this is quite controversial, but I believe that it's, it's a good question to ask ourselves, right? So globally, we have about 43% of the agricultural labor force being women. And now I'm quoting a statistic from, uh, from our sister agency, the Food and Agricultural Organization, right? However, when it comes to formal, I'm going to put quote unquote, formal rights to land, to water, into other resources, even just mere inputs, right? Seeds, you know, fertilizers, uh, instruments. It is not at all, you know, just, it's not at all fair, right? And then what happens? We come in with development approaches that are promoting, you know, maybe, you know, mechanization, irrigation, whereby when you do that, then the crops that are being grown are the cash crops. And then the space for the women, instead of increasing actually further windows, it's a paradox, but you know, where there is the money, the men are going to go and the women's space is going to reduce because naturally the women are being pushed out since they don't have the access to the land and to the water. And I mean the formal or legal access in this case, right? And so you have um, something that should be really good for everyone, irrigation, for instance, not depending on rain for agriculture. And in this case, when I talk about uh, Burkina Faso, for instance, or any of the Sahelian countries, you're talking about one rain for season per year. And then it is rain fed agriculture. So can you imagine what is happening when the rain season and the production season is gone? So we need water. We really like crucial, it's a crucial need. All right, now put that aside. We, we, we create perhaps irrigation of some sort. How do we ensure that in that space, women are not pushed out? And it's still, a, a, it's, it's an ongoing question. You might get it right in this context. It does not necessarily mean that you're going to get it in another right in another context hence the importance of uh, you know uh, context specific programming context specific responses to issues and that's what I would say. So that's uh, that's one. So you find that, and then again, of course, to the issue of sanitation, crucial in agriculture. No one thinks about the women. In, in, in the context where I work, the farms are not near to the homesteads. So perhaps in the homestead, you have a latrine, but you will not have it in the garden. No one is thinking about that. And people have walked miles and they're not work, work, working in the garden alone. They're working alongside with the men. The men can easily ease themselves anywhere. What about the women, right? 
another important uh, nuance to think about when we, we consider what uh, ge the gendered impact of water in agriculture. Uh, and really, uh, again, the issue of, um, yeah. you know, ensuring um, not just the formal rights, of access of, for women to these to these productive resources, but also ensuring the sustainability. In the case where we are saying, if you you avail water, you avail it sustainably for agriculture. You're addressing issues of nutrition. You're addressing issues of safety of water for drinking. You're addressing really life-saving issues, including the fact that the women won't need to go far into the forest, for instance, anymore to fetch water. So more or less, and globally speaking, can we change the way we program? Can we not be in a hurry to program, but actually listen to the different contexts and then make sure that the solutions we are working on are owned by these communities, are sustainable okay. and respond to the multi, a multi-dimension of, of, of needs and issues. Thanks and over. Thank you, Anne. And, and this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of, of women being most affected and doing such a big part of the work and yet lacking the power to actually uh, take part in the decisions and the access to the resources. And thank you also for linking um, this issue to, to sanitation issues. This, this uh, highlights once again that we can't just think about things in silos and that we have to, to that everything is so connected. Um, so thank you for to all three of you for highlighting uh, those those issues in your different contexts. If we now turn uh, more to to solutions, um, uh, first Professor Grace, uh, you've talked about SDGs before. Um, so there are two sustainable development goals um, that are are especially linked to our topic today. Number five is gender equality, and number six is water and sanitation. Um, how have, have you seen uh, accelerating number five, so the gender equality SDG, impact the achievement of uh, the SDG number six on clean water and sanitation? How do you see those two being linked and the solution to, to those two being uh, linked up as well? Okay. Um, thank you, Nina, for, for that uh, question again. I would like to answer this by first um, sharing some of the findings from the um, research we just concluded on differential impact um, assessment. We went in to look at the differential impact of poor water quality and wash, you know, on <clears throat> in, a, in a pilot case study in a particular location. And uh, very quickly we realized that the absence of public water sources, you know, actually forced majority of the individuals. By majority, I'm talking about more than 80%, you know, of, of, of um, the community, you know, to rely on household water um, alternatives. And th this is worrying, the fact that failure to meet the universal access, you know, of SDG 6 by 2030, which is just um, around the corner now, is unlikely in that, in that location, you know. Another, another um, finding is the fact that there's this prevalent use of shared sanitation facilities you know, short of safely managed facility. And again, in terms of proportion, we are talking about 90 something percent. So it's quite high, you know, in detail and washing facilities as, as well, you know. So this um, makes it so clear that um, <laughs> race towards uh, achieving SDG 6 in that, in that locality is, is, is highly unlikely. But to layer on, on, on that, we also realized that the study reveals a lot of gen gender-based disparities, you know, across all the water-related issues, you know, be it as uh, uh, <clears throat> water quality or wash or health-related culture, health-related practices, menstrual hygiene is, is all gender. It's not gender neutral, you know. So for us, we realized that very quickly addressing gender-based disparities in WASH and health interventions in that particular location, you know, is crucial, you know, to fast track um, SDG 6. So until you resolve the gender-based issues, you will not be able to fast track, you know, SDG 6, which is <clears throat> um, achieving uh, affordable water, you know, and, and sanitation and, 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 and health. And again, this speaks more to the aspect of governance, 
You know, we've all had it. That's part of the rhetoric I was talking about. We know it over the years that women are water managers at the household level, you know, but when you get to the decision making level, how many of them are there? you know, at the country level, at the global level, you know, at higher level beyond the household, how many women are represented in decision making in, in governance. So this is what we need to shift, you know, and that's why we are talking about, you know, statistics, you know, so let's quantify, let's see, you know, so that maybe by the time you are faced with, with your status, you know, in terms of statistics, it can now help you to start re-strategizing. Okay, I want to increase from this minimum level, you know, you know, move higher, you know, to keep increasing the number of, of women to, you know, to help inclusive water, water management and probably uh, push things better. So the bottom line, what I'm saying is fast tracking SDG 5 is crucial to fast tracking SDG 6. Until we figure out and target, you know, fast tracking gender equality into the water se sector space and uh, by extension into every space, in, in, you know, in, in particular, we may not be able to fast track or achieve SDG 6, you know, as at Wendy, because again, 2030 is just around the corner. Thank you. Thank you, Grace, and uh, thank you for highlighting that the yeah, gender needs to be mainstreamed in in all other SDGs, right? And especially in in SDG six, um, as those two are are so linked. And uh, it's also very interesting to see that uh, things that Anne and Adnan mentioned and and see um, every day in their work uh, is being confirmed by by the research that you're doing and by the studies that you're doing. And this is it's crucial to have data on that. Again, re repeating myself, but <laughs> it is very important. Um, and you mentioned before that um, that women are only briefly acknowledged for their role in natural resource management and that they don't get um, as much uh, power and access, whether it's about traditional knowledge on land and water management or uh, experience with drivers of climate change. How can we better take advantage of women's experience and expertise in resource management while also recognizing the diverse context that you, you presented today? Oh, thank you. Thank you again, um, Nina. And um, sometimes when you are in the real space, you wish there was a magic wand that you could wave and answer the questions. But I guess uh, uh, following up on what Grace just mentioned, unless we respond to you know gender mainstreaming, gender equality, gender equity, we are never going to answer the other gender related questions. So, uh, and I, I believe that perhaps maybe uh, the feeling I get is that sometimes people get this fatigue about discussing these issues, especially if you're not really within that context, right? Or you're not as negatively impacted by it. So we really need um, people like Adnan. We need people who will not stop making noise about these things. We need people who continue to talk about it. So in other words, open up the spaces, continue uh, where they are open, keep them open, right? Uh, maybe the policy was developed and it's not being implemented but then what shall, shall we just uh, put it in the trash can and forget about it I, I don't think so right and then individually so currently within the UN system you know that uh, you know each agency each organization has this mandate has this thing they are doing but what I would really really think we can even do much better is how working together synergizing Right. And I know that there is this whole push for the one you end delivering as one. Yes. But they're actually doing that on the ground. And I'm, I, I am glad to see that the, even what uh, Dominic referred to as the traditional donors are beginning to push for that. Right. So maybe maybe a donor like Canada is interested in nutrition or a donor like Norway is interested in water sanitation, whichever case it may be. Why we don't oblige people to actually work together because if we are all in the same space each one addressing a different nuance I'm very sure that the statistics that Grace will get out later will be different so real real partnerships on the ground partnering for impact on the things that affect women right and then number two and uh, maybe number one actually can we really listen 
to the beneficiaries? Can we not go with our preconceived notions? You know, and um, just a little bit of a funny story here uh, of a certain part of Uganda where I come from, where uh, some agency went and put boreholes very nice initiative, bring water, which is clean, closer to the women. But the women's complaint was, oh no, we will never get space to escape our husbands and go you know, to collect water because that was the time when they hung out. That was the time they went out in ports, right? So it's a good initiative to bring water closer to these women. But at that point, nobody thought about the fact that they actually would love to walk a little bit from home. So how do we then address their need for the space to hang out as fellow women discuss while at the same time ensuring they have access to clean water. This cannot be something you formulate on a document when you're sitting behind a desk. You need to be in the field. You need to talk to the beneficiaries. You need to listen to them. Okay, that's that's one example, but bringing it closer to home, to where I am in Burkina Faso, uh, it, and this is a personal experience I've had where we were promoting gender mainstreaming in this project in ATC and access to financial resources for the women, right? So we go to this place and we are telling the women to tell us about what they are doing, but the men are around and the women can't say anything. And then we are insisting, please tell us, let the women come forward. And then we learn later that the reason, uh, so well, it came to be, can we separate the groups, men, women? And then it comes out that the women say, Madam, we cannot speak when the men are around because if we go back home, we're going to be beaten up. It's a simple thing. It's a cultural context. Women cannot speak when their husbands are around. You will not think about this when you're programming from a distance. So you need to do the programming bottom up, I must say. And I know that we've been there before. We should just go back and refine. Okay, so that's what I would say. And then on the question, if you will allow me, is it okay, Nina, if I go on to the question of the financing, which I've seen many people are posing in the chat. Uh, financing uh, for development, financing for you know gender inclusivity, financing for all these things that we are pushing for in the SDGs. Uh, yes, I'm sure we would have loved to have everyone keeping the finance flowing the way it has been, but the context has changed, right? But that does not mean that there isn't actually resources. I think people are just saying, let us do it differently. So if before we had the traditional donations where people just give the money, either as a basket fund or a specific fund, ETC, right now, why don't we seek closer partnerships with the private sector? Why don't we marketize things so that we have sustainable ability. In other words, you could give someone, you could give a girl a pad, but that's not going to solve her problem for the rest of her life. Investing in other as, uh, aspects, education, employment, access to better, you know, resources of production. These are all the things that are holistically going to get us to the finish line. And yes, unfortunately, we are so close to 2030. So we now need to be thinking even beyond that. Thank you, and over. Thank you, Anne. There was a, a lot in what you said. Definitely, uh, uh, lots of, of excellent points. Um, I think your your point on on um, bottom up approaches is is crucial. Um, uh, people who are actually living the realities of of the policies that are being implemented need to be part of making those policies. Um, and in the meantime, until we reach that, uh, I think the people who actually live this. Uh, are have a role to play in making sure that the right policies are being implemented and followed up on. This is something that we also work on a lot with youth, that youth can play this role of making sure that um, governments, authorities, um, organizations in general actually like implement the policies that they that they put in place. Um, There's definitely uh, a role that that can be taken uh, by civil society, by women uh, in general. Um, Adnan, we were talking about activists and advocates, and we do have gender advocates and activists to thank for their tireless efforts in keeping this issue at the forefront of feminist advocacy in local uh, contexts and in global forums. So I wanted to ask you, um, how can we better understand the role that women and girls have in promoting water? Um, in promoting women's leadership, in promoting uh, equitable allocation of resources in uh, Bangladesh climate prone areas and how uh, locally led actions can empower them. Yes, thank you. And I'll just echo on 
what Anne said, and um, thank you, Anne, for saying <laughs> the local level needs. And when you talk about advocates, usually we have this preconceived notion that activists are, and I'm sorry to say this, but activists are people marching in the streets, or you see people um, throwing paint over uh, paintings, which are we recently seeing. But for us, um, activists, uh, especially uh, feminist activists, are our beneficiaries, as Anne was mentioning. And I'll share a story with you. Um, so in Bangladesh, um, especially um, donor-fed um, projects, what happens is that after a certain period when the donor pulls out, um, usually what we see is there's no sustainable mechanisms for those vulnerable people to keep sustaining themselves uh, over, uh, over the next couple of years. And we have been seeing those um, maladaptation practices happening for a long time. And hence, um, private sector engagement is something that is changing those scenarios. For example, from WaterAid, we are currently more focusing on business models, business approaches that can ensure that our beneficiaries are um, given the safety net if and when um, a donor moves out, they will be able to continue to sustain those infrastructures. For example, a rainwater harvesting system or a pond sand filter for fetching water um, so that they keep sustaining themselves. And in those spaces, um, advocates and um, feminist ideologies are breaking the taboo and norms. And oftentimes we usually don't hear their stories um, because they usually don't get a platform. So one of the approaches um, we have, and I'll answer two questions uh, that came up. Um, why are we moving to a different model of funding? Reality is we're not getting the climate finance we needed. The 100 billion is still, um, I don't know where it is. Why are the LDCs and, uh, are not getting the adaptation funding? And if we are seeing a persistent intense and frequent cyclones, um, we uh, our government is losing their um, GDP and they need to play catch up and we need to also do different kinds of interventions to help those people in need. So um, there's a definite lack of um, climate finance. And at the same time, um, we are seeing uh, cuts of wash funding from the global north. And so it's really important to have those um, other means of accessing um, finance uh, from different areas or private sector. Coming back to the story. Um, so th uh, the story about um, a woman, um, a vulnerable woman, um, what we call hardcore poor or ultra poor. She didn't have anything. Again, uh, to set up a context, um, um, this um, uh, lady in particular, um, her name is Gita Roy. Um, she comes from a um, Hindu um, religion background in a Muslim majority community. Uh, she usually doesn't get the um, necessary needs of uh, the community um, in comparison to her um, other community members. Oftentimes she doesn't have access to different education or different uh, facilities other people in the communities have. So through those business approaches, we are trying to empower different women, girls, um, differently able people, so that they know how to run those businesses after we um, leave or to empower them so that they get a platform. And interesting story about her is that she came from nothing and she became the sub-district um, uh, chairman um, after that intervention. And that's uh, one of the success stories we are seeing in those areas that these people have the grit and the wit to actually make the impossible possible. And again, through a, sim a simple um, intervention, we are able to do it. And the intervention is called a we we approach or a, a woman um, entrepreneurship um, approach um, for women empowerment. Um, so basically in a nutshell, what it does is that if you have an intervention, we teach business models and so that they are self-sustaining and self-financed. And when the self-financed aspect comes in, they need to access different market avenues in those particular area. And that's where the private sector comes in. And if they're open to ideas, private sector entities, 
these people have good access because again, um, they come from nothing, right? So having those platforms and uh, building the ability to actually speak about it and um, making their voice heard, those are the advocacy um, activists in those particular areas uh, we are empowering. And we have countless other Gitaroids in all over Bangladesh, not just Bangladesh. I'm pretty sure they are in um, countries like Burkina Faso as well, um, in Canada as well. As well. I was there in Canada, I saw those um, young women changing the scenarios in Canada as well. So not just in Bangladesh, but you just need to give that them that platform so that they know how to change the different rhetoric. Over to you, Nina. Thank you, Adnan. Thank you for um for giving those those um avenues for uh, in terms of funding as well. Um, I think it's it's definitely important to think about about the sustainability of the funding and and I think we um as as Dominic mentioned in his opening remarks, we are uh, in the development sector quite uh, sometimes averse to including the the private sector, but in terms of sustainability, that can um do a lot and and the context is changing and we do need um to find different ways of, of doing things as, as we've heard um, several times today. Um, I have a last question for all three of you. Um, and if I can ask you to, to keep your, your answer um, concise so we can still um, address a few questions from the audience. Um, in terms of um, very concrete actions, um, how, for the people who are with us here today, how can the audience engage further in terms of learning more about these issues um, and your efforts and, and the initiatives that, that are being um, put forward at the moment? Um, we can start with Anne. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, could you please either repeat the question or tell me which one it is in the chat? I don't think I had it very well. Sorry, it's it's one of the, it was one of our final questions uh, um, ah. just for the ah. for the audience to know how they can engage further. So if the people here today want to want to engage further after this panel, how can they, how can they do that? Okay, okay, great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to specifically talk about the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Like I said, we work in the rural space, so not quite attractive to most people, but I can assure uh, uh, whoever is listening that if you're young, you're in university, you're looking for a space to, you know, practice what you've been learning in theory now in real life, there are opportunities to work in the field. Uh, be it in, in Africa, Latin America, Asia. We have offices all over the place. We have country programs in almost 171 countries. And these uh, programs deal with different topics, you know, be it value chains, be it, uh, you know, uh, access to, fi to financing, be it, um, you know, whatever you can think of that is happening in the agricultural space in a given corner of the world, we are in it. Uh, you know, uh, PC culture, um, sorry, I was digressing there, but you know, like um, aquaculture rather, that's the, the word, aquaculture, uh, agroforestry, um, you know, natural resource management, all these spaces. So there are opportunities and we also are in need of hearing what is on the cutting uh, edge of, you know, of data, data mining and etc so you have that kind of person come and uh, you know go to the ifad website try to to join as an intern reach out personally to me if you don't know how to do that and then try and come on the ground and maybe you will make a difference in fact not maybe i'm sure that you will make a difference because the young people they are our future and they are able to do a lot of things if you're also a practitioner in the private sector for instance you could partner with us in in the rural areas I'm talking about, what are the real things we are doing, for instance, to address these issues of water for women? Um, so for a place where there is only one rainfall season, we have very limited options, but we still use them. 
we have a water con conservation, you know, rudimentary water conservation practices where we dig deep wells and reach out down there for the water and conserve it. And then it can be pumped to the vegetable plots for the women during the, 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 the dry season. And then of course the same water is used for them to drink. And also there are, we provide the toilets, like I said, for them to be able to use when they come to their vegetable gardens. And it is so, you know, maybe you have a technology, an innovation that can actually make this access to the waters better. Because what I'm talking about, when I talk about a deep well in, in the field, it's a real deep hole in the field, well constructed with concrete, but the women have to pull out. Sometimes if we don't have the solar powered pumps, they have to pull out the water with a, 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 a local pulley. And I mean, the, like a rope and a bucket. It's very labor intensive. It's in my view, quite unsafe because if it's a smaller person, a young kid, you could fall in there and then you lose your life. So we're looking for innovations, for instance, to help us address those things. So, and I know that there are people with great ideas out there. So it would be nice if the practice can meet the research, can meet the innovation, and then we have perhaps more impactful solutions. Uh, thank you. Over. Thank you, Anne. Um, uh, can we go to you, Professor Grace, um, to uh, what you wait for an audience to, to engage further? Thank you. Um, I'd like to pick on the opening remark when Dominic was talking about climate smart investment or gender smart investment. You cannot fix what you don't know. You know, so if you actually want to, you know, invest in, in, in anything climate smart or gender smart, try by investing in differential impact assessment. I'll digress a bit. The advocacy really is that if you must conduct any impact assessment at all, be it environmental impact assessment, you know, health impact assessment, economic impact assessment, make it a differential impact assessment. Now, back to the water context. So for climate um, smart investment, for gender smart investment, invest in differential impact assessment. So we would like uh, people to partner you know, on this project, on this research project with us on water related actions, water climate related actions. You know, um, we need to dig deep, it's wide, it's big. You know, what are events, impact of other events, differential impact of other events, you know, so um, we'll, we encourage, you know, people to partner with us, you know, in terms of funding. So if you want to make every dollar count, invest in DI, uh, differential impact assessment for targeted and appropriate interventions, you know, to, and also for targeted resource allocation, you know. Aside from that, I will also... Um, in terms of the quantification of women in, in the water sector, like I said, is an ambitious project. We've designed a short survey to collect data on several specific um, indicators, largely stemming from UNESCO WWAP toolkit on sex degraded water data. So I've pushed the um, survey link, you know, is now accessible to all the participants. So it would be nice for all water actors, you know, in the water domain, water education, uh, public utilities, water related industries, um, national ministries. So if you know that you are within the water space, the water domain, you know, we, uh, we um, encourage you to please help complete that survey you know, which we are using to collect sex aggregated data to be able to, you know, quantify women's representation in, in the water sector. That's the next big project that, that we are working on. You know, we'll, we'll appreciate this. We also take in terms that you and you in way, you know, so for anyone who is interested, you know, to volunteer, you know, whenever the, the vacancy, you know, is available, we encourage people to also participate and engage. It's a good opportunity to also work in the global research space within the uh, water climate, you know, gender um, space, you know, or in the water sector, you know, at all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Grace. Um, last but not least, can I ask you the same question, Adnan? Yes, of course. Um, so three things from our end. Um, Water Canada, for example, have a close working uh, relationship working with the First Nations and um, also the LGBTQ movement. Water Canada is leading that. Um, so if, if you're based in Canada, please reach out to Water Canada. 
And um, it would be really interesting to see, especially um, our other water sector actors, um, if you can um, partner, to, especially through the advocacy bit, I think we'll be able to bring about different change in Canada for global. We have the water and climate campaign. Um, as part of the campaign, um, we are also, for example, one of our campaign asks is to empower youth. Um, so we go to different schools, um, we do talk shows, and we also talk about the intricate linkages between um, water and climate. For example, one of our advocacy um, um, ask was that um, climate change is water change and how that impacts um, different generation of students, uh, especially um, the kids who grow up eventually live in that uh, world. Um, given um, that reality is something we do. Um, another recent campaign of our is Walk for Water. Um, if you go to our UK website, you will be able to see it. Especially, uh, this is a campaign we are doing to the different water aid country programs, as well as the Federation, uh, especially um, advocating that um, the problems and the burden a woman face in terms of fetching water. And every, um, so basically walk for water, you'll be able to walk in their shoes. You have to walk five kilometers. And if you do walk five kilometers, you will be uh, will be donating um, some of our funds um, to uh, one of our uh, prominent charities. Um, th so these are the different ways you can get involved. But please do reach out to me. Um, I'm active in LinkedIn um, and um, the different uh, country programs, um, including that of Water Aid Canada and Bangladesh. I'm happy to help. And please um, don't stop talking about it. And it's really important and uh, keep raising your voice and that keeps the movement going. And as an activist, it's really important I say, <laughs> please continue to do so. Thank you, over to you, Nino. Thank you so much, Adnan. Um, and so as time is running out, we don't have time to, I don't have time to uh, ask you specific questions that were posed by the audience, but um, I, we have answered those questions um, as we went uh, in, in your different interventions and also uh, by writing. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for also keeping an eye on the, on the Q&A um, side of things. And thank you to all three of you for, for really uh, highlighting the issues specific to each of your contexts, to sharing your ideas on what solutions should look like, being in terms of uh, governance mechanisms, of funding, of research, and also sharing uh, specific project initiatives that, that uh, you are already working on. Um, there is a lot of work to be done, definitely, but there's also very in inspiring and important uh, actions being taken already, as you've shown today. Um, so this is a, a really um, great conversation. Thank you so much to uh, the three of you for being here. And I'll pass it back to Kim for closing uh, remarks. Thanks so much, Nina. This is quite something. So I kind of want to just breathe and say like, wow, that was such a far reaching conversation. And on behalf of all of us at OCIC, the whole community, I just want to thank all of you. So Dominique, Nina, and Professor Grace and Adnan for sharing all of your insights, your expertise, uh, the stories. I think that's very powerful when we hear specific stories, and I really appreciated that aspect. Uh, just a couple things that stood out for me, and uh, I know, Nina, you've captured them so many times, but I just wanted to pull it back for myself to say this focus on the need for increased data and research, um, statistics that show the differential impacts of issues and access to resources, uh, the need for increased gendered intersectional analysis and deep listening to lived experience, particularly from vulnerable groups, um, the need for context-specific programs and responses and women and girls to be involved in decision-making and governance, that until we resolve the gender issue, we will not be able to fast-track and achieve any of the SDGs, um, and then to connect the dots between all of these issues, perspectives, and challenges, and to look into new ways of engaging with the private sector, and I, I think with all of um, each other in the water and climate sector, um, and I loved the one to the call to not stop making noise, um, to keep opening up the spaces, to tapping the collective agency as experts, as advocates and activists, and as the public, um, you know, to synergize these efforts, to listen to communities and each other, and to make more impact. So it has been an absolute 
privilege to learn from you today. Um, and now we want to invite everybody to complete a little Zoom poll that's going to pop up on the screen. Um, so while you're doing that, I just wanted to um, let you know that we are today kicking off with this event, OCIC's International Development Week 2024 program. And we, along with uh, numerous organizations in our membership, in the sector, and all across Canada from coast to coast to coast, are hosting activities um, for International Development Week that are virtual and that are in person. And we'd like to invite you to join some of those. One in particular that we're hosting that ties directly to today's panel is an innovation lab that will be held uh, Saturday, February 10th at the University of Waterloo. So please look below for the details on that, um, the link in the chat. Um, I think the poll is still up. So please go ahead and complete that. And I'd at the same time like to give a sincere thanks once again to all of the contributors as well as all of those behind the scenes. So especially to Pragya, Arabelle, Sarah, Shehara, Mishka, and Lisa for all their efforts within OCIC to make this happen. And to our colleagues, Julie Truelove from WaterAid Canada, Julie Marshall from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Dr. Nina Tang, United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, and to the International Secretariat for Water for their support in enriching the panel and bringing together these partners today. A warm thanks as well to Global Affairs Canada and to all of our colleagues at the Engaging Canadians branch for their financial and logistical support to this and all of OCIC's International Development Week 2024 initiatives. So thank you for joining and I hope you have a great day ahead.